Welcome to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. A look behind the curtain of global finance and monetary control with one of the foremost experts in the field. Author of the bestseller Web of Debt and the Public Bank Solution, Ellen Brown's groundbreaking work began the movement to create new American public banks. We'll look at issues surrounding the world of money and the systems and powers that control it, as well as the progress being made on the public banking frontier. The program is underwritten by Public Banking Associates, a national consultancy of experts advising government leaders pursuing creation of their own public banks at publicbankingassociates.com. I think it's about resources. It's about control of the U.S. empire and ensuring uh, U.S. unilateral power around the world. The U.S. is losing that grasp of power. And so a lot of countries are being targeted with economic sanctions and economic warfare. It's a shame that banks are being used as a weapon of war, but that's what is happening in Venezuela, Nicaragua, Hong Kong, China, Russia, Syria. These, these, are, these are economic weapons that the United States uses, and it's going to really cost the United States because you can already see how countries are working around U.S. sanctions, cutting the United States out of trade deals, not using the dollar uh, in, in making these deals. So dollar domination is going to come to an end, and that's going to have a big impact on the U.S. economy, and will be one more step toward the end of U.S. empire and the end of U.S. unilateralism around the world. When we talk about our money, we aren't just referring to the change in our pockets, the balance in our deposit accounts, or even the balance sheet of our cities and states. The big piles of money are created at the national and international levels, and that's our money too. Today, we're going to take a look at how some of it is being spent and manipulated, both in our name and not in our interests. That opening comment is by one of our guests today, Kevin Zeese, a former colleague of Ralph Nader, a lawyer, an activist for democratic rights and economic justice the world over. Kevin and his wife, Dr. Margaret Flowers, have been on our program before, but today's visit is a very special one that we'll tell you about in a moment. First, let me say hello and welcome once again to It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. I'm Walt McCree, Ellen's co-host and colleague at the Public Banking Institute. Today's program is going to dip into the news and some items that the corporate media doesn't really want to talk about since they don't really want you to know what's actually happening around the world relative to citizen unrest and action against unfair economic policies civic deprivations of various types stimulated through austerity, and the dominant rule of oligarchs and their corporations who control our governments and industries. This, of course, is all enabled by and for money and its control. In the case of Venezuela, what continues to brew is a CIA-led effort to overthrow a duly elected democratic government, supported by corporate and banking interests in a typical U.S. imperialist fashion, especially in Latin America, but elsewhere as well, which is accomplished through economic terrorism, doing what invading armies used to do, taking control of other people's lands, resources, and governments. So again, when we talk about our money, it's particularly important that we talk about how we enable and allow our money powers to do these abhorrent anti-democratic actions in our name. We think you'll appreciate hearing from a credible frontline expert on the Venezuelan situation. And we also think you'll be shocked to hear what these people are facing by our government, who is determined to send them to jail for protecting the Venezuelan embassy in Washington, D.C. Our other guest, Tyson Slocum, who is Director of Public Citizens Energy Program, reports on another undercovered story by the mainstream press. The clearly fraudulent actions being made by Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase to invest and control large energy production systems and to capture those markets by misrepresenting their ownership and thus avoid banking and regulatory controls. 
If you've seen the recent movie The Laundromat with Meryl Streep about fake offshore companies created for just that reason, you'll want to hear Tyson's report. More deception by Wall Street? Who'd have thought? So I think we're looking to upset you a little bit today as we investigate just a couple of examples of how our money is being deployed against our interests under the cover of mainstream media darkness and how these examples should give us all a wake-up call for reviving the democratic action that's needed to expose these truths. As Justice Louis Brandeis has said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Now let's talk to Ellen. Well, Ellen, the news of the day is filled with money in action around the world. And you've been talking about how our Federal Reserve has been collaborating with Wall Street interests in the repo market. Bring us up to date on that. Okay, yeah, there's some pretty interesting developments on that. As I said the last time we chatted, uh, the Federal Reserve has been injecting billions of dollars into the repo market, which is basically a pawn shop where um, big institutional investors, including hedge funds, go to uh, get liquidity. So they put up some sort of collateral. It's supposedly a repurchase and it's repo stands for repurchase. So it's supposedly a sale and repurchase. But the catch is the collateral remains on the books of the borrower who is supposedly the seller, even though supposedly they've sold it. They get to keep the collateral. So the collateral, before 2008, most of the collateral was mortgage-backed securities, and uh, a little bit was government securities. But after 2008, it was the the, uh, mortgage-backed securities, of course, that were turned out to be not safe as everybody thought and so it was the repo market that actually triggered the 2008 collapse a run on the repo market when when the lenders figured out that uh, the collateral was no good and they pulled their money out Um, so after 2008 the collateral was virtually all uh, or the best collateral and most of the collateral was US securities federal securities, but there weren't enough federal securities. Even though the government has been pumping out debt like crazy, there still are not enough federal securities for this trillion dollar a day repo market. And so they rehypothecate, meaning they use it several times over. They, they Because they're able to keep this these securities on their books, they can then use it for collateral for another loan and another loan. On average, they're used for about three different loans. So about three different <laughs> uh, lenders all think they own this this, colla- this same collateral. So U.S. securities are not really as safe as they are alleged to be or thought to be. So the repo market interest rate shot up to 10% in September and that freaked everybody out because if you're a bank, most banks now don't go to the Fed funds market, they go to the repo market. So to get their liquidity if they don't have sufficient deposits, which they typically don't. So they go to the repo market and borrow at, um, right now the rate is 1.5% in the repo market. So if the rate goes up to 10%, and they've got loans out at 5%, let's say, that'll kill the banks. So that freaked everybody out. So so the Federal Reserve stepped in and uh, became the lender of last resort, or basically the buyer of of, uh, collateral. So now, as of last Friday, the collateral is <laughs> collateral now. 80% of it is mortgage-backed securities again. So it's this toxic, toxic collateral because the federal t- will take it. They'll take anything. They're the, they're a deep pocket, and they're they're an indiscriminate lender, as I saw one one podcast characterized it. And they're talking about a permanent repo facility instead of trying to manipulate the Fed funds rate. They'd just be manipulating the f- repo rate, which means they would set a rate like 1.5 percent and just hold it there by continually doing injections into this market. So all that is serving the big banks and the big institutional investors. And the reason the uh, lenders pulled out in September, apparently, there are several reasons, but one reason was that they no longer trusted the borrowers who are now largely hedge funds. The hedge funds have kind of taken over the market and they are highly leveraged, like they borrow on top of borrowings on top of borrowings. 
the the notion of stability under pinning our financial our banking interests is very tenuous tied to specious sort of claims of uh, securities that have been given out multiple times of the same thing uh, the whole system seems to be compromised Right. And so we, in the public banking movement, were always stumped with what are we going to do with this 110% collateralization requirement, where if you take public deposit, if we, a public bank, takes, let's say a state-owned bank takes the deposits of the state in California, um, that those deposits have to be collateralized with 110% security of some sort. So, And it's supposed to be good security. So what the big banks do, it turns out, is they buy these, they use the money to buy securities, federal securities, paying 1.5%, the short-term securities. And then they use that as collateral in the repo market, which um, also pays 1.5%. So basically they get their uh, liquidity for free. Now, we could also do that in with our banks, so I think that's pretty exciting, really. We can basically, if we can get liquidity for free, then that substantially cuts down our costs, and we can definitely show a par- profit over, over the big banks because we're cutting out all the middlemen, et cetera. So how would we do that if we had a public bank? Okay, uh, you have a public bank. You take in, let's say New Jersey, takes in all New Jersey's, deposits into the Bank of New Jersey, the new bank created by your governor, <laughs> and uh, buys U.S. security, federal securities with that money, which is what they're supposed to be do. They're supposed to collateralize their deposits. So securities right now, one month securities are paying uh, 1.5%. But, you know, the securities are there in the books of the bank. They can use that as collateral in the repo market which costs them 1.5% to borrow. And if the Fed is going to guarantee that rate, you know, if they're going to go in there and stabilize the whole thing, just like they used to maintain a Fed funds rate of 1.5% or 2% or whatever, now they're talking about maintaining a repo rate at 1.5%. So we don't have to worry that suddenly our rate's going to go up to 10% and we're going to get stuck. It's always going to be 1.5% because the Fed has our back. But... When you go into the repo market, your security is still sitting on the books of the bank. So you still have that collateral backing the deposits, even though it has been used as security in the repo market with the ultimate buyer being the Fed. And in fact, in in England, in the UK, the Bank of England is the repo market. So they, they skip the middle step of collateralization. They just go right to the repo market. And uh, or right to the Bank of England, which is the deep pocket that makes these loans. So we could do that as well. And so I think that's actually a good development. Even I mean, it shows how the big banks have been manipulating the system all along, and the little right. banks, or or you know, the public banks, are struggling to figure out how we can make a go of it. Well, we can do it the same way they do. We just have to figure out what they're doing. And now that the Fed is making the repo market very safe, <laughs> we should do it. I think it's great. Well, thank you uh, for setting us up with that. And, and we'll get on and, and hear what Kevin and Tyson uh, have to say. Okay, great. Talk well, to I- you. Now let's turn to the discussion between Ellen and Kevin Zeese. Kevin and his wife, Dr. Margaret Flowers, are known internationally for their impressive leadership in the field of democratic and economic social justice. Their website, popularresistance.org, offers news, insights, and perspectives into these issues from around the world that give a much fuller picture of the events of our day than described by mainstream media, if they get described by mainstream media at all. Kevin and Margaret led the charge a few years ago to stop approval of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. The campaign was called Flush the TPP. The TPP was an agreement widely seen as a SOP giveaway to transnational corporations over the interests of labor and the environment. 
Now these intrepid activists find themselves targeted by the U.S. government for helping to oppose the CIA-led coup action in Venezuela. You might ask, why should the U.S. be concerned about Venezuela? Or Iran, Libya, Syria, and so forth. Well, money, of course, and more. There are other connections to money. I mean, uh, one of the major things going on in uh, Venezuela is a U.S. economic war uh, where they have even stopped the U.K. bank from returning gold that Venezuela has deposited in the bank. And so they've been turning the Western financial system against Venezuela uh, to stop it from having access to financial markets and to uh, res resulting in shrinking its economy and causing incredible economic challenges for the people of Venezuela. Uh, we, we're being prosecuted in federal court because we were the final four. Along, I'm being, I'm being, Margaret Flowers and I were two of the final four uh, people who were in the Venezuelan embassy uh, last spring, uh, last uh, April and May, uh, when the U.S. government sought to uh, allow it to be taken over as part of their right-wing regime change, you know, coup effort in Venezuela. So we are facing federal charges in the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C. People can read about it on defendembassyprotectors.org. Uh, that's the, the site of our the committee that formed to support our case, defendembassyprotectors.org. And we're being prosecuted for interfering with protective function of the State Department. Uh, we're not being prosecuted for trespass or uh, unlawful entry because we were in the embassy with the permission of the elected government of Venezuela. They gave us a key. We could go in and out, and for the first, the first half of the 37 days we were in the embassy, we could go in and out with no problem. Uh, but then uh, on April 30th, there was another coup attempt by the U.S. puppet Juan Guaido uh, and, uh, in Caracas, and that failed immediately, but at the same time that happened, uh, the, uh, there was a whole group of pro-coup supporters, a pro-coup mob made up of various people from uh, Latin American countries who had fled their countries, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, who had left their countries when uh, left-wing governments were put in power, and they were out there terrorizing us. They, we were under siege at the Venezuelan embassy. There were about 70 people uh, staying in the embassy uh, at night, uh, in the first part before the siege began, we had events every night, forums uh, on AFRICOM, on Honduras. Uh, we had John Kiriakou, a former CIA agent, who talked about what it's like to, to uh, regime change, what it's like from inside the CIA, which is a really interesting uh, talk that should have gotten national attention because it had some really great information in it. Um, and uh, we had concerts and cultural events, and so we had 100 people coming in and out of the embassy at night, 70 people staying there uh, overnight, and uh, then when the, the, the siege began, um, they were trying to terrorize us, and by that point, some people had already left because they had to go back to work or school or take care of kids or go back to their job and couldn't spend the night uh, in, in the embassy any longer or for health reasons they left, but as the, uh, the crew mob outside began to uh, block food coming in the embassy, assault people who were our supporters outside the embassy. And when people were assaulted who were supporting us, they were the ones arrested, not the person committing the assault. Uh, and uh, the, the police didn't do anything to stop the mob from blocking food from getting in. It seemed pretty obvious that the police and the mob were working uh, hand in hand. Uh, we even overheard uh, police talking to each other outside. Uh, we could hear from uh, the garage uh, in the driveway in the garage, there was a, a, a shift change, and the police were describing the situation to the new shift, and they said that the people who were outside the embassy, uh, right by the embassy, the, and, the, and the police had allowed them to put up tents and uh, equipment and just surround the embassy, uh, the people outside the embassy were essentially the government, the police said. And then they said the people uh, outside of that, we had a whole group of people behind that who are our supporters, uh, they're, they're peace activists who are, sent, who, are, who are paid by Russia or something. You know, so that was the police perspective. Um, and then we also overheard uh, some of the coup mob talking, to each, talking on the phone to people, and uh, they said that they were essentially trying to terrorize us to get us to leave the embassy. And they were doing that because under international law, 
the Vienna Convention does not allow the host government, in this case the United States, to go into the embassy uh, of a, a, a government that has an embassy in the U.S. And so they needed the permission of the elected government of Venezuela to enter the embassy. Uh, and so uh, uh, they were trying to frighten us uh, with all sorts of noise and, and these strobe lights that were blinding us and uh, these constant uh, verbal attacks and physical assault on our allies. Uh, it was just amazing uh, conflict that should have been covered by the corporate media because it was really in the heart of Washington, D.C., in the very expensive neighborhood of Georgetown, this big embassy, five floors with a basement and two floors of garage below it, big embassy that housed 80 people, was surrounded and under siege and in constant conflict. It would have been great TV, but it really showed how well the government controls the corporate media that this was not covered because it would have raised questions about the uh, U.S. coup attempt in Venezuela, and people would have to start to ask questions about who's president, what happened with this Guaido, what's this going on. It would have started to explain things and pierce the false narrative that is just getting worse and worse, by the way. And so we're facing with these federal charges up to a year in jail and up to a $100,000 fine each. So that's pretty serious, wow. a, a, a big, big fine. Uh, and uh, the most recent developments uh, are that the uh, Trump prosecutors filed a motion uh, to limit what the jury is allowed to hear. That's called a motion in limine. This is very common with jury trials. Uh, it's basically the rules of the trial. And in this motion in limine, the, the government is asking that we not mention that Maduro is the president, that we not question the, the, the legitimacy of Guaido, uh, that we do not tell the jury that we were in the embassy with the permission of the elected government, uh, and that uh, food was being blocked, that there was a mob outside, that we cooperated with the police to help protect the embassy. Uh, you know, all the amazing, if, if, if the judge approves this motion, It'll be very hard for us to uh, tell the truth to the jury, especially to tell the whole truth, because if we can't say we were in the embassy with the permission of the elected government, who was the elected government, Maduro's administration is the elected government, uh, the, it, the jury will be totally confused, and uh, we won't have much of a defense if we can't tell the truth. Uh, so the judge will decide that on January uh, 29th, and then uh, if things go according to plan, February 11th is the current date for the trial to begin. So uh, people are organizing. The defense committee is getting people uh, aware and up to date on what's going on. There's a uh, frequently asked questions page on the uh, defendembassyprotectors.org website so we can get more information. And people then can also come to uh, Washington, D.C., or if they're in Washington, D.C., come to the trial and, uh, and participate in the uh, uh, being in the audience and uh, and really uh, showing the judge that we do have uh, uh, some political support. Wow, that's amazing! Your heroes in my book for for going through all that. that. That's the bizarre thing about it. You know, when we were in the embassy, uh, we didn't realize how many people were watching the uh, live stream. We had embedded journalists uh, who were in the embassy and people outside. Telesur was covering it regularly. Uh, people in Latin America knew about it, and people watching the live streams knew about it. And we, we've been doing a tour. Uh, we just got back from Florida. We already had gone to California and Illinois. We're about to do a tour in um, um, New Jersey, Philadelphia, uh, New York City, New Haven, and Massachusetts. Uh, and so people can come out and hear more about it at the t during the tour, or they can donate uh, to our legal defense fund as well on the uh, defendembassyprotectors.org website. Uh, and when we go on tour, it's amazing how people were watching this on almost an hourly basis. For many people, this was a gripping conflict. Uh, and we were told that uh, from people in Venezuela that our action totally changed the conversation about uh, Americans in Venezuela. They, they were, people were amazed that, peop that uh, U.S. citizens would put themselves uh, at risk for the Venezuelan government and for the independence of Venezuela. You know, we, uh, this is not a pro-Maduro event or anything. It was a, a pro-sovereignty, pro-independence event and an opposition to U.S. imperialism. They actually had solidarity marches in Venezuela while we were in the embassy, uh, which, you know, had signs, Margaret, you're a hero, Kevin, you're a hero, uh, and our other, and, and it was like, and people were sending us uh, through uh, Twitter and social media 
uh, songs they had written about us and performing songs about us that they had written. It was just, and, and sending us positive tweets. It was just really incredible, the, the response. And so Latin America is very aware of this. Most people in the United States are not aware of it. The only media, corporate media, I should say, that covered this was when we were arrested. And so the, the story was four arrested at Venezuelan embassy. None of the none of the context of what was really going on. People had no idea it was a 37 day uh, project with uh, 70 people sleeping in the embassy and hundreds of people going in and out of the embassy to show support for international law and to prevent a takeover of the embassy by a failed coup. It was really so. It's quite an it was an incredible experience, and we hope that, that we get a fair trial. If we get a fair trial, we I think we'll be acquitted. Uh, if not, we'll just do do our best to build the movement. Uh, based on the unjust trial. So either way, we're going to try heat building the movement to uh, end the U.S. Uh, in intervention and regime change efforts in Venezuela. Wow. And people, Americans, we think that we have a free press and we think that we that we are better than the rest of the world because, you know, better than China, let's say, because we really know what's going on. We have access to that information, but we really don't. People don't realize what they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. That's the thing that we have seen when we have traveled. I've been to Venezuela twice in the last year. I was there earlier this about this time a year ago, and I was in Venezuela for the election in May of 2018 when President Maduro was reelected. Yes, there was an election. He is not a dictator. Uh, I, I saw the election. There were five candidates running. Uh, he won 67% 60, of the vote. Uh, there was a very strong opposition candidate who was a former governor uh, in one of the states. And so it was a, it was a real election. The U.S. Uh, tried very hard to get people in Venezuela to boycott the election. They even threatened Henry Falcon, the leading uh, candidate against Maduro, threatened him with sanctions if he ran against Maduro because they really thought they knew they couldn't beat Maduro in the United States. So they wanted to undermine the legitimacy election by boycotting it. Uh, that's often what uh, U.S. coups do when they can't win democratically. They try to claim it's not a democracy and boycott the election and try to falsify that it was not really an election. But in fact, there were more than 300 international election observers uh, monitoring that election from Venezuela. And I, I, was, I was there invited by uh, Intrabid News Service to go down there and uh, report on it. I've been an election integrity activist in the United States among some of the issues I've worked on has been uh, improving our electoral system. And uh, the fact is that Venezuela runs elections better than many U.S. states do. And they do that uh, with great intention. Uh, under the Venezuelan Constitution, unlike, unlike the U.S. Constitution, there is a right to vote. As a result, they have 96% of people in Venezuela registered to vote. They actually uh, take it upon themselves, the government does, to register people. They want to get to 100%. That's far superior than, than U.S. registration. Of course, in the U.S., we are uh, deleting people from registration roles rather than adding people uh, to them. And they, they do a number of unusual things. Uh, I'll just mention one. Uh, on election day, before they uh, uh, announce a vote result, uh, every precinct is required to do a random audit of 54% of the machines on election day. And they can do this because unlike the U.S. and many parts of the United States, they have both an electronic vote and a paper ballot. So the paper ballot is reviewed by the voter and put into a ballot box. At the end of the day, the randomly selected machines, the 54% of the machines that are in, so they take the paper ballot, they count each ballot, with the media, the public, all parties, opposition candidates, all candidates are allowed to see this vote count. They show every ballot to everybody, and they count it. And they compare that to the electronic vote. If it's consistent, then they count the votes from that precinct. If not, they count all the votes by hand from that precinct. Uh, and so that they call that a people's audit. In the U.S., of course, some places cannot be audited because there is only an electronic ballot. And, a recount is just pressing the machine again, and the same machine recounts it. If there's a software error, you get the same software error result. Uh, and, and, and in places that do have a paper ballot, uh, a recount, there's lots of rules about recounts and audits that make it very hard to have a recount or an audit. Uh, and so the Venezuelan takes the opposite approach. They make the 
audit a routine part and make it a public part of the process. That's just one example along with registration. Those are just two examples of how the, uh, the democracy in Venezuela is actually superior to the U.S. in many ways. And if we would stop calling Venezuela a dictatorship, we could actually learn a lot about democracy uh, and, uh, and, and Venezuela. They're moving, toward, they're moving toward direct democracy where the people participate in decision-making uh, and, and, and want to see that as the method of democracy for the future. Right now it's a representative democracy, but they do have participatory and direct democracy uh, at the local level. It's a really interesting process, and we could learn so much from Venezuela about what deep democracy really looks like. Wow, that's great. So what's your, imp your sense of why are we blockading Venezuela economically and just like we're blockading Iran economically, and, uh, which is technically an act of war, I think, um, well, you know, what's, that, that, what's, yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. I think the, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the U.S. economic wars around the world uh, are, first off, illegal. What, what they, they, we call them sanctions in the United States. What they really are is unilateral coercive measures. Under the U.N. Charter, you cannot uh, coerce governments to change their, 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 their representation. Uh, and the unilateral course of measures, these sanctions are designed to force countries to change and bend to the U.S. will. That's a very serious abuse of uh, economic power, a serious abuse of the Western banking power, because all of these sanctions uh, involve blocking Western banks from financing uh, projects in those countries. I think the reasons why Venezuela is targeted are two reasons. One, it's a bad example. It's an example of a country that declared its independence uh, is no longer controlled by the United States, is no longer part of U.S. empire as it was prior to 1999 when Hugo Chavez was elected. I think the same is true for Iran. When they had their revolution in 1979, they broke from U.S. domination, ending the rule of the Shah, who was put in place by the United States and controlled by the United States. They are being punished for their independence. I think that's true of Venezuela, too. They don't, the U.S. does not want to see an example of a country that can leave the U.S. empire and succeed. So they do their best to destroy those economies. And if that doesn't work, then it goes into regime change, uh, 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 cyber, you know, cyber attacks, which we've seen in Venezuela, it goes into military threats, military wars. It gets, you know, escalates from there. The second reason I think that Venezuela is under attack is because it has tremendous resources. People already know, I think most people know, Venezuela has the most oil reserves of any country in the world. Uh, they have the uh, highest uh, reserves of diamonds uh, and of uh, gold of any country in the world. They're number one in all three of those, number, number five in gases. But I think the most important thing the U.S. wants is their minerals. They have minerals that are essential for electronics and for weapons. The U.S. has a real problem with that. The U.S. has to even rely on China for some of those minerals. And China is our number one target in this era of great power conflict, which is the new national security doctrine. The war on terror is over. Now we're in a phase of great power conflict with Russia and China at the top of the list. Iran is on the list as well. But uh, the U.S. cannot be dependent on China for precious metals. Uh, and so they need to find another source. And Venezuela is one of those sources, just as Bolivia uh, is a major source for lithium, which is critical to electric batteries. You know, for batteries for cars and, and the future of electronics. Uh, Bolivia had made a, an agreement with China uh, to mine uh, uh, lithium, and Bolivia was going to produce products from that lithium. Uh, and that shortly after that deal was made was when the, the coup uh, that's currently ongoing in Bolivia uh, began against Evo Morales. So uh, although they had tried various coups before against Morales, they escalated once this lithium deal was made. So I think it's about resources. It's about uh, control of the uh, U.S. empire uh, and uh, ensuring uh, U.S. Uh, unilateral power around the world. I think that's the U.S. is losing that grasp of power. And so a lot of countries are being targeted with economic sanctions and economic warfare. It's a shame that banks are being used as a weapon of war. But that's what is happening in Venezuela, Nicaragua, Hong Kong, China, 
Russia, I mean Syria. These, these are these are economic weapons that the United States uses, and it's kind of really caught the United States because you can already see uh, how countries are working around U.S. sanctions, cutting the United States out of trade deals, not using the dollar uh, in in making these deals. So dollar domination is going to come to an end, and that's going to have a big impact on the U.S. economy, and will be one more uh, step toward the end of U.S. eminent empire and the end of US, U.S. unilateralism around the world. Wow, you said that so well. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. You have some great insights on all that, and you've really done great work. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. The two websites I'd urge people to visit would be defendembassyprotectors.org, which is the website for the uh, committee that has formed to help us defend ourselves against the U.S. government. Uh, and the, our main website is Popular Resistance. PopularResistance.org is a, a website that covers movements and movement news in the U.S. and around the world, as well as a place to organize uh, various movement activities. It came out of the Occupy movement. When Occupy finished, we met with other occupiers and other activists and decided what does the movement mean now, and we decided that a media site where we could organize and educate people uh, was the key, and so Popular Resistance was formed, uh, and that, that is our main site, popularresistance.org. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's been really great talking to you. Our next conversation is with the Director of Public Citizens Energy Program, Tyson Slocum, whom you may have seen on one of many national media channels discussing the energy industry and the related public interest issues that that vast empire touches. Tyson was recently featured in an article by the American Prospect's David Dayen, which was called Goldman Sachs Shell Game. Tyson's work exposed how the megabank created 61 different off-balance sheet corporations with the help from companies that were based in the Cayman Islands. There's, there's two separate cases um, that uh, I've uncovered uh, at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. One involves J.P. Morgan and its efforts uh, to conceal its control over a private equity fund called Infrastructure Investors Fund to acquire a franchised electric utility called El Paso Electric. We're still fighting at FERC to uh, get to the bottom of that transaction. Separately, in December, I came across an application at FERC by a company calling itself Goldman Sachs Renewable Power. And in this application for something called market-based rate authority, which is basically if you want to sell power in the United States, you have to have market-based rate authority. So this is a it's very important application for any power seller to possess. And in this application, Goldman Sachs Renewable Power comes right out and says, we have no affiliation whatsoever with Goldman Sachs. Uh, so that raised my alarm bells. And after an investigation, I found that Goldman Sachs absolutely controls Goldman Sachs renewable power. So while these are two very different cases and involving two different banks, there are huge similarities uh, in the approaches that these two banks are taking. Namely, that in each case, both J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs have gone through great efforts to actively conceal their control over private equity uh, companies. And by concealing their control over these private equity companies, uh, they are benefiting from enormous financial and regulatory benefits. And so um, what we're trying to do is simply pull the curtain back, expose these, these sham uh, shell company structures, demonstrate that the banks control them, and have federal regulators clearly label these private equity entities to be affiliates of J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. Uh, and that will mean a lot when it comes to their regulation by the Federal Reserve as bank holding companies, but also importantly to protect consumers uh, and some of the investors 
uh, in these private equity funds who are mainly municipal pension funds, cops, firefighters, teachers that are entrusting their life savings to these banks, labeling them as affiliates will ensure that the uh, pensions money is being protected and that consumers will be protected from any potential nefarious market manipulation activity. What benefits are the banks getting that they wouldn't otherwise get and what will happen if they get they come under the regulations so that they have to fess up? Great question. So first, um, let's just look at for electric power markets. So let's take Goldman Sachs, for example. Goldman Sachs, uh, there's this new private equity fund called Goldman Sachs Renewable Power uh, where pensions and other institutional investors have invested almost $4 billion into this fund. And this fund has turned around and used that pension money to buy some large uh, solar generation facilities throughout the United States. So right now, those solar facilities are legally unaffiliated with Goldman Sachs. But what Goldman Sachs is doing is they're saying, listen, we're going to put up a dummy three-person board that is going to make all the final decisions. And our investigation showed that this three-member board, they're actually individuals associated with these Cayman Island firms that provide rent-a-director services. And we uncovered that uh, they, in addition to serving on this Goldman Sachs Renewable Power, serve on more than 60 other shell company uh, private equity firms that all have ties to Goldman Sachs. So Goldman is just recycling these same three directors over and over and over again, really limiting their ability to be truly independent. But that's not all. Goldman Sachs then provides all of the staffing and management and operations of these private equity shell companies. So Goldman Sachs is running the whole thing. Goldman Sachs Renewable Power has no employees. All of its employees are provided by Goldman Sachs. And so the danger of them not being labeled affiliates is the pensions have bought these solar assets. Goldman Sachs is now managing and running these assets. And what Goldman Sachs will do is say, okay, we've got the pensions have bought these big solar uh, producing facilities that produce electricity for very, very inexpensively. We are going to transfer that inexpensive power to Goldman Sachs's commodities trading division, who will then resell that power at a higher price. In this scenario, if Goldman Sachs is not an affiliate of Goldman Sachs Renewable Power, then when Goldman Sachs off takes that cheap uh, uh, solar power and resells it at a higher price, it is Goldman Sachs that pockets that profit, not the pensions that put up the money to buy the facilities in the first place. So from a consumer standpoint and from a uh, investor protection standpoint, it is crucial that Goldman Sachs Renewable Power be deemed an affiliate of Goldman Sachs, because if they are legally deemed to be affiliates, then FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has a whole bunch of strict rules that prohibit affiliates from engaging in those types of abusive transactions. And so, um, and the same goes for J.P. Morgan and uh, its IIF affiliate that it's trying to acquire, El Paso Electric. Uh, in the case of El Paso Electric, there's hundreds of thousands of captive customers paying their utility bills every month. El Paso Electric also owns a bunch of power plants. If J.P. Morgan is deemed not to be an affiliate of Infrastructure uh, uh, Investments Fund, then J.P. Morgan can uh, plunder and loot those valuable assets. Uh, so again, making sure that they are affiliates for purposes of the Federal Power Act is essential. For purposes of them being bank holding companies, obviously, we need to accurately reflect all of the assets and operations on their books, because among other things, the Federal Reserve puts bank holding companies like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs under various stress tests. Um, one uh, feature of El Paso Electric 
is that El Paso Electric owns 15.8% of a nuclear power plant called Palo Verde uh, in Arizona. So right now, J.P. Morgan is not is trying to say it is unaffiliated with IAF, and IAF is the entity trying to buy El Paso Electric. If I'm successful in getting J.P. Morgan to be deemed an affiliate of El Paso Electric, that would mean that J.P. Morgan would now have on its books uh, an ownership share of a nuclear power plant. And I think that would drive the Federal Reserve stress test off the charts because all of a sudden now you'd have to build in all of the liabilities associated with owning and operating a commercial nuclear power plant. And that's not something that a bank holding company should be doing. So I think that there are a number of issues from investor protection to consumer protection to um, systemic risk issues that require federal regulators to deem both J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs to be legal affiliates of these uh, private equity firms uh, that they're engaged with. Wow. So if they're not affiliated, though, like right now they're technically not affiliated, and let's say there was a nuclear accident, then the pension funds, I guess, would wind up holding the bag and J.P. Morgan would get off? Is that Right, right. Yeah, because right now, um, you know, uh, the Infrastructure Investments Fund is just a series of uh, shell company limited liability entities. Uh, So it's actually unclear what the liability would be to um, the pensions uh, since they are limited partners. But making sure that J.P. Morgan is directly and legally affiliated with this entity, uh, you know, is what's needed. Are you basically describing a scenario in which by owning this renewable cheap energy sources that they're able to set rates independently and that they're able to boost the revenues that would come from an otherwise less expensive source of power? Uh, That's right. And, And, you know, I'm not trying to say that I don't want financial institutions to be investing in or providing capital for renewable energy projects. I think this is uh, a a critical endeavor. But we need to have transparency over these transactions because what Goldman Sachs is doing here is taking other people's money, buying the asset – and then running the asset as though it belongs to Goldman Sachs, not to the pensions. And so in order to institute the protections that we need, we just simply need to accurately label who the actual owner is. And in this case, it's clear that Goldman Sachs owns and controls uh, Goldman Sachs Renewable Power. And so that's all we're asking is that they be deemed affiliates. Um, I think that the banks will be reluctant to move forward with these transactions if they are deemed to be legal affiliates. In the case of Goldman Sachs Renewable Power, I think the end goal is to try to spin this off with an IPO. Um, So the initial capital will come, you know, from private institutional funders, uh, but Goldman eventually, I think, wants to take this uh, Goldman Sachs Renewable Power entity to make it go public. And speaking of public finance, Tyson, as director of the uh, Public Citizens Energy Program, you see this all across the country. Do banks have a a large participation rate in uh, controlling power companies? And should they be or should we be focused on bringing that into a a public financing arrangement? Would that be a better situation for us? Uh, Absolutely. So so the banks have definitely, you know, since the the financial crisis of their creation in, in 2008, Uh, the banks have pulled back from their control over uh, physical energy infrastructure. Um, They they still have a presence, but not nearly as big as as it was pre-2008. I think what we're seeing now is the banks sort of doing a backdoor effort to control these assets um, through these uh, private equity shell companies that on paper appear to be separate But when you dig down deep and and start looking at the details, it's clear that the banks control these. And so, yes, I have huge concerns. J.P. Morgan has a terrible track record in U.S. energy markets. Uh, They were forced 
uh, into a $410 million settlement in 2013 for manipulating U.S. power markets. Uh, they had a, a brazen scheme, mainly in California, where they were able to rip off consumers uh, to the tune of, of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so we've got a situation where the banks uh, have a poor track record in operating facilities in U.S. power markets. And given their huge role in operating as a registered swap stealer, um, where they are uh, acting as an entity on the other side of the transaction or operating a clearing desk on their own of uh, different financial products. They're heavily involved in proprietary trading and commodity markets. I have huge concerns with the banks owning and controlling physical energy infrastructure assets. Uh, and so we need to understand that the banks are being very sneaky about their expanded involvement into energy markets. And I think these FERC proceedings are an important opportunity to introduce important protections and disclosures on the bank's control over uh, power plants and other energy infrastructure. Wow. Could you, could you go into some more how they ripped off uh, California? <laughs> yeah. So um, beginning in, in 2010, so this is way after the original Enron ripoff of 2000 and 2001. Um, so uh, when J.P. Morgan acquired Bear Stearns, uh, they inherited what's known as some tolling agreements over uh, some large natural gas power plants in California. Tolling agreements mean that you don't own the power plant, but you control all of the output or capacity of that power plant. So uh, another company called AES, their workers are the ones at the power plant, but those workers all respond to whenever J.P. Morgan called. And so J.P. Morgan figured out a loophole in California's reliability rules. Uh, this gets a little technical, but it's important. So um, a power plant takes some time, especially a natural gas power plant. You can't just turn it on and, uh, and immediately start generating electricity. Um, you can operate it in what's known as uh, uh, spinning, where you keep the facility on and in a moment's notice, uh, it can quickly uh, start generating electricity. But it costs money to keep the power plant in what's known as spinning reserve. So California has a whole bunch of complex formulas where they say, if, if you keep your plant in spinning reserve, we're going to pay you a whole bunch of money uh, as a financial incentive so that if we need power, we can quickly call upon you. And so what uh, J.P. Morgan figured out very quickly is they busted through this algorithm and understood very quickly how to manipulate it so that they would know for a fact that they wouldn't get called upon but still receive the payments. And so as a result, they never put their power plants into spinning reserve. So again, keeping your power plant in spinning reserve um, makes it ready to generate power at a moment's notice, but it costs a lot of money to do that. So what J.P. Morgan did was it told uh, folks in California, our plants are available 24 hours a day for you, when in reality they weren't operating at all. And so J.P. Morgan was getting uh, tens of millions of dollars in payments that they weren't entitled to. They figured out how to game the system. When they were confronted by state officials in California who then referred it later to federal regulators at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, J.P. Morgan repeatedly lied. And that's what drew the ire of folks at FERC. Uh, uh, so, in fact, there was a non-public staff enforcement report um, that parts of it were leaked to the New York Times. Um, and what the, the non-public staff enforcement report found was that uh, they suggested a fine of a billion dollars against J.P. Morgan and referral of criminal prosecution 
against Blythe Masters and several of the other traders for blatantly lying to FERC investigative staff during the course of the investigation. Um, Then what happened was uh, days after this staff enforcement report uh, came out, J.P. Morgan made a unilateral announcement that they were voluntarily leaving power markets. And then shortly after that, FERC reached uh, a much smaller settlement, this $410 million settlement, rather than the billion dollars, and no criminal referral against uh, Blythe Masters and other top J.P. Morgan executives. So what we saw was that there was a gentleman's agreement there between FERC and J.P. Morgan, that if J.P. Morgan uh, volunteered to leave you know, its ownership and control over power generation, that FERC would then go easier on it in the enforcement case. So what's interesting now is just several years later, J.P. Morgan is firmly back in the power generation business, but instead it's concealing its uh, involvement through uh, its control of these various uh, shell company entities like uh, Infrastructure Investments Fund. I'm thinking of two, two words that start with C that refer to the bank's attitudes, chutzpah and cojones. <laughs> Yeah, it's this. This is a lot of uh, chutzpah here, and the thing is, is you know, at this point, Public Citizen is the you know only entity in the docket. So we're the only entity that is formally raising these challenges. Um, so we've had some success. Uh, you know, we started raising issues in the J.P. Morgan proceeding back in September. And on December 5th, FERC issued what's known as a deficiency letter saying, uh, hey, Public Citizen has raised enough uh, issues um, about J.P. Morgan's control over this entity trying to acquire uh, El Paso Electric that you, J.P. Morgan, and IAF have to disclose a whole bunch of detail. And in that December 5th letter, FERC alluded to the fact that it is considering labeling J.P. Morgan and this uh, private equity firm, IAF, as formal legal affiliates. So we'll be filing renewed protests at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, urging them to label J.P. Morgan as a legal affiliate of IAF. That's Tyson Slocum, Director of Public Citizens Energy Program. You can find out more information about Public Citizen at citizen.org. Well, that's it for this edition of It's Our Money with Ellen Brown. Our thanks to our guests, our sponsor, Public Banking Associates, and to you for listening. Be sure to check out Ellen's latest writings on the economy and the changing world of money by visiting ellenbrown.com. And for more information on public banking, visit publicbankinginstitute.org. For information on how local and state government leaders can obtain professional insight and counsel about public banks from key national experts, visit publicbankingassociates.com. I'm Walt McCree. See you next time on It's Our Money with Ellen Brown.